LSI Spotlight, I'm going to be talking to Dr. Andrew Preston, who's reader in microbiology at the University of Bath. I'm going to ask him some questions about how we test for the virus that's causing the current pandemic. And I should explain to everyone watching that Andy is my colleague in the biology and biochemistry department at Bath, but that I'm interviewing him through an internet link, partly because the university is closed, but also because both he and I are isolated at home on account of the virus. This is part of a series of interviews about the science behind the COVID-19 emergency. Don't worry if you haven't yet watched the other videos in this series. Andy and I are going to try to make sure that the material in this program is self-sufficient and understandable all on its own. But you should be able to find the other talks by visiting the BRLSI website. Hello Andy, thanks for talking to me today. Uh, we're going to be doing uh, a BRLSI Spotlight talk uh, and um, you're a microbiologist and I'd like to ask you some questions uh, about uh, the COVID-19 disease and the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes it. Uh, you're a microbiologist, uh, so you know things that most of us don't. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's a headline uh, on the BBC News app today uh, saying that there's mounting concern over the low rate at which testing for the virus is being ramped up. And it would be really good for people to know more about the scientific background to this testing. So uh, perhaps you could tell us, uh, you know, what is the test that's currently in use for this virus and, and, and how does it work? Sure. OK, sure. So the main test that's been the focus of those headlines is um, one of two sorts. It's the actual viral genome test. So the, the, you've seen the, the RT-PCR or the PCR testing. So this is the test that uh, asks the question, do you have the presence of the virus in your system? And it does so by targeting the nucleic acid, so the actual genomic material of the COV-2 virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Right. So so uh, here we're, we're actually talking about RNA, ribonucleic acid, rather than DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid, aren't we? Indeed. So in terms of the actual test, that requires one additional step. But really, it doesn't make a lot of difference. We've been doing RT, so reverse transcriptase, PCR. The R reverse transcriptase is the step that makes a DNA copy of that RNA viral genome, which is by far and away the best substrate for them, the PCR, to act on. OK, cool. PCR, what's that? So that is the polymerase chain reaction. So this is now, I mean, this is used globally over the last 30 years, 20, 20, 20 odd years, really. And what it does is it, it gives incredible sensitivity to the detection of DNA. So it's an amplification step. It gives an exponential amplification so in most of these tests that we're using, in theory, you should be able to detect a single copy of that viral genome and produce sufficient signal that it's detectable in a laboratory assay. So again, we have tremendous sensitivity to these assays. We can also, through the design of the assay, make sure that we're targeting very, very specifically um, the COVID-2 uh, RNA. So again, how do you do that? How, how does the specificity work? So in the PCR test, we use tiny little stretches of um, synthetic DNA primers, they're called. And it's these that set the target that is amplified in your PCR test. So very soon after the identification of the causative agents of the COVID pandemic, uh, China, uh, determined the genetic sequence of the virus and made that publicly available. So again, it was actually really quite straightforward scientifically to design primers to make that PCR test very, very specific for the SARS-CoV uh, 
COVID-2 virus. So we know that if the test is being done correctly and performing correctly, we're only detecting that one specific virus and not any of the other related ones that are in circulation. Right. So the test that's actually being used on a large scale at the moment, is this targeted against the whole of the viral genome or is it just uh, one gene or, or a bit of uh, DNA uh, that's less than the size of the whole virus? Sure, no, it'd be just a short stretch. So these these diagnostic PCRs usually work maybe on, on a stretch that's uh, as little as 200 nucleotide, 200 bases, whereas the entire genome's closer to 29,000. But again, it gives you that ability to A, make the test much more quick, uh, fast to, to conduct. It makes it much more efficient, so the longer the target, the more problems you have technically in the assay. And so a short stretch also means, of course, you know, we know that the, 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 the current virus is, say, 80% similar to the um, SARS, original SARS or the MERS virus. So if you try and use too large a region, you run into difficulties with that specificity. So we can, we can select for a short region that is absolutely unique to the current pandemic virus and, and, and focus the test on that. Right. OK, so you, you mentioned a moment that this is an extremely sensitive test. Uh, does that sensitivity actually cause problems? I, I don't think so, because, again, don't forget the way we're using this test. We're asking the question, does somebody have the virus? And um, we need to know whether they've got it, even if it's at low levels, because, of course, the virus is going to replicate very quickly within the host and actually picking it up at even very early stages is going to be hugely important. Of course, we have the complication uh, that within the UK at the moment, um, we've been using it really to test hospitalised patients. So those uh, displaying um, clear symptoms. Uh, so if they do have the virus, it's likely to be at quite high levels. So. Um, but now that we're starting to, to test frontline health workers, it's really important that we can pick them up, even if they're the very early stages of the infection. So I think the way it's being used, even just knowing whether someone's got a trace of the virus is still very, very important. I see. Uh, I can remember that uh, when I used to do this uh, uh, kind of stuff uh, in the lab, that uh, it's very, very important uh, to remember that what you're doing is producing a very large amount of the virus at the end of your amplification. And it's very important to make sure that that end product doesn't get back into the start of the process and so that you would finish up with a false positive. Uh, do, do you think that that's an issue for testing? Is, is there a possibility of false positives? Or do you think that people uh, have worked out how to do this pretty in a pretty fail safe way now? Well, the way that these tests are run, you run multiple samples simultaneously, hundreds of samples in the way it's done. And most of it is now, um, at least at least in the in the official labs, uh, fairly automated. So we have robotic systems uh, that, that handle many of the samples, taking it through to getting them into the PCR machine. And a lot of those systems are really geared towards preventing contamination between samples. Of course, uh, so I, uh, my understanding is that one of the issues that they've had is that some reagents have been found to be contaminated from the point of supply with with virus, meaning, of course, then you're going to get false positives. But let's assume yeah. everything's running correctly. Then on within each time you run a batch of samples, you're going to have what we call a positive control. So a sample that we know contains the virus target and therefore should always come up as a strong positive. But also we'll have what we call negative control. So very carefully handled and set up samples where we know that there should not be any virus present. And so, of course, we'd expect those to be negative. And those will be the ones where we can tell whether we've got contamination issues such as the ones you've just mentioned. Well, that's very reassuring, actually. Um, it's always good to do controls, isn't it? Absolutely. OK. Um, uh, so how do you actually uh, do this in the lab? Uh, you just mentioned that sample handling uh, 
is done uh, in parallel and using uh, robotic handling, uh, that's all very fancy. Um, but uh, the, the actual amplification uh, of using the polymerase chain reaction, how does that work? Uh, do you have uh, a clever machine that does it all for you? So it, it can be. I mean, I know that this is being rolled out or trying to roll out into other labs. So this will be done sort of fairly manually in some cases for labs maybe conducting hundreds of tests a day. So this is a bit like you know, cooking. So you've got your recipe, so several different reagents that need to be uh, assembled within each tube or well of one of these multi-well plates. Uh, added sequentially and and then you're, you're set to put it into the the thermal um, cycler so pcr uh, involves at least two different temperatures um, to cycle through uh, that that's done automatically by, by by the machine itself and again we now even have robots for putting all of the reagents in and, and again for covid testing um, the reagents will come sort of pre-assembled so all you really need to do is to add in your sample from from the person in question so i just think it's really that the major part is still the actual processing of those samples that come into the lab there's some steps oh, right. required to prepare that sample such that if the virus uh, rna is present in the sample it's been extracted uh, any potential inhibiting factors if you think this is likely to come from a, a mucosal sample there's going to be mucus and other possible factors in there that could inhibit the PCR reaction itself so they, so that the viral RNA needs to be purified away from those factors um, to make sure that if it's present it's going to be detected okay I see um, and uh... So we were just saying that uh, it seems as though there's uh, some kind of limitation on the amount of testing that can be done. Um, what's really holding this up? Is, is it the time that it takes to do the tests or, as you've just suggested, the time for sampling handling? Or is it uh, actually communicating between labs moving things around or is it even the availability of the materials that you need to do the test what what's the hold up so this has been an area of intense debate uh certainly within the media over the last couple of weeks obviously we've had various um statements from the authorities with with the desire to ramp up testing. We're constantly being compared, for example, to Germany and South Korea that appear to have a much greater capacity for testing. So I think this is probably a culmination of, of, of different factors coming together to create holdups in the, in the entire process. So at the start, um, your national public health infrastructure is going to be a key factor in what testing you're able to do. So most diagnostic testing for the communicable diseases in the UK is done by Public Health England. So we have a series of regional labs. And so we only have eight regional labs across the country uh, that handle a lot of uh, specialist tests such as this. Whereas Germany, they have a, an infrastructure that has over 50 labs that, that, that are part of their network. Um, so we've, we've had a, a limitation in terms of the numbers of labs capable of performing the tests. Now, of course, what they're doing is rolling out, trying to bring more labs into this network. So the hospital pathology and diagnostic lab network is being brought in. And of course, we're setting up specialist testing centers, Milton Keynes uh, and, and other ones. But of course, it's really important that these tests are what we would call harmonized across these labs. We need to ha have utter certainty that the, the, the results coming out of one lab are equal to the results coming out of another, um, particularly in terms of saying whether someone's got the virus or not. So this means you need to, to develop standard operating procedures, send them out to the labs. They then need to demonstrate using a set of, of, of samples, these positive and negative um, control samples show that they're able to perform the tests such that we have complete certainty that they're going to a negative test from them is truly indicative 
of, of the sample being clear of virus and of course making sure that if there is a, a virus containing sample they're going to pick it up as a positive mm. you need so these tests a they require laboratory infrastructure pcr machines some of the robots of course they require trained people at all stages uh, people who know what to do in terms of s processing the samples running the assays and of course in, in a public health setting, these, each test has to be signed off. So again, you need trained people who are accredited to, to view these results, to, to, to look at all of the, the, the data coming out of each run and make, make that decision that the run has operated satisfactorily and therefore sign off on the tests if these are going to be taken as the official results. Not only just providing data, but also, the, you know, particularly for healthcare workers saying, yes, you are OK to return to work or to continue to work on the front lines. These are really important decisions. So that takes a lot of time to set those up. It's not something you can do overnight. If you really want to know that over a period of days, these labs are, are performing to the, to the level we want them to. We're now seeing, of course, um, stories about shortages of the actual reagents themselves. So obviously worldwide demand for COVID testing is now outstripping the supply of the reagents. Uh, and unfortunately, the UK, you know, we're not home to any of the actual manufacturers of these reagents. And so we're competing on a global supply chain for these. And I have seen some um, stories where people are saying it's difficult to get hold of, for example, the primers or even some of the enzymes and, and other parts that require to run these tests. So I think all of this comes together to create um, a delays in, in ramping up the testing that the government and, and other authorities have said that, that we're aiming for. But I think, you know, this is going to be a, a retrospective exercise to, when, when this has hopefully died down to take a look back and to say, where were the real bottlenecks? Because clearly what we need to do now is to prepare ourselves better in the future. That if we, you know, a new virus emerges in the coming years, we're in a position to react much faster and, and have that infrastructure where we can sw almost switch it on overnight. Yeah. Yeah. Well, really, it wouldn't be surprising if there were a bottleneck with the supply of reagents, would it? Uh, because now that the United States is really ramping up its effort, uh, they're going to be taking uh, a lot of these materials. Yeah. Sure. Uh, you know, a number so, of the manufacturers um, are based uh, in so, Germany. So talking about the, the test, once you've got the sample, um, I mean, what, what about taking the sample in the first place? Is, is that problematic? It, what it, kind it, of samples are, are being used? Is it a matter of spitting in a tube or something like that? No. So, so the, the, these generally for this virus test are, are swab samples. So a little sort of equivalent to a cotton bud on the end of a long plastic shaft. Um, so there's a couple of sites that we can use to sample the virus in terms of sort of the official procedure. Uh, but it actually, so there's a nasal swab where you insert the swab up through the nostrils, but actually the sampling site is right at the back of the nasal passage. So uh, the swab has to be inserted quite some distance. And if you know the CDC guidance in the US is actually the swab should go in far enough that you know, essentially you're as far back in the nose. So you're sort of midway between the entrance of the nostril and the start of the ear opening. And that's, you know, that's so it's not just a case of running a swab around the, the, the sort of uh, entrance to, to the nostrils. You can also take an oral swab, which I think is, is the preferred site used in the UK. But again, that's not just running it around the inside of the cheek, which I think I've seen on a couple of these videos of, of testing centres. This is, you know, the, the preferred site is the posterior pharynx, which is the back of the throat. So if you imagine both of these, your normal reaction to someone trying to shove a wooden stick up your nose or, or <laughs> to the back of your mouth is to sort of veer away. Yeah. So, of course, any yeah, test yeah, it's tricky. Absolutely. So they, they do need to be taken properly by people who know what they're doing. Yeah. And of course, any test, so we're, we're, you're only going to pick up the virus if it ends up on that swab at the time that the sample is taken. So, of course, yeah. there is still the danger that someone might have the virus. But if the swab doesn't completely pick it up, then it will come back yeah. as a negative. 
So in hospitalized patients, you can then take a different type of sample, and that will be fluid from the lower respiratory tract. But really for that, they need to be either producing large volumes of fluid or sedated in order to be able to, to extract that. So that's really for the hospitalized patients for those. Um, yeah, yeah. With, you know, we, we use this swab testing and then PCR or RT-PCR to, to diagnose the presence of a, a fair range of viruses. And even for, for all of those, we know that there is still a degree of what we call false negatives. And, um, you know, I've seen widely accepted figures of anywhere up to 10 percent of tests might come back negative, even though you've done everything correctly. It's just, you know, there's a, you know, several points at which you may fail to detect the virus. And all of those combined yes. do produce this false negative value. So, again, you know, that has implications for how you're going to use it. So I think, you know, in China, for, for discharging a COVID patient, they, they were requiring um, consecutive negative uh, virus tests taken over, you know, either consecutive days or a period of days once the symptoms had died down. And that's an indication that if you want that 100 percent certainty, one test you know, is a very good indication, but not a 100 percent guarantee. Well, you know, um, what you're saying here is is uh, very interesting. The the issue of what are you doing this test for anyway? Um, from what you've been saying, uh, this test is purely uh, a test of whether the virus is there. Uh, you're Absolutely. not really going to use uh, knowledge of whether the virus is there to influence your treatment of the disease that there aren't drugs that we can use to treat someone and uh, if someone's having difficulty breathing uh, then there are symptomatic ways of ad addressing that but this test is not about how to treat to treat somebody it's really about whether they're infectious isn't it so, I mean, at the moment, we're at the point of the epidemic where I think if someone was coming in displaying the classic symptoms of um, COVID disease, then you wouldn't necessarily be waiting for a test before you initiate treatment. Although if you've got someone displaying pneumonia or acute respiratory distress syndrome and they do come back negative for the virus, you may then want to, you know, the question is, well, what is then else causing it? So I think yeah. you still need that information to know whether you sort of recommended oxygen support therapy, your isolation it, it is really you know, going to do the trick or whether they've got something else that actually then needs a different treatment regime. And of course, if someone is COVID negative, you're not going to move them onto the COVID ward. So I think no, there is still a no, role for that is, clinical decision making. Yeah, yeah, but you're right. If someone's coming in, high temperature, cough. Yeah. Um, the current, you know, the current thing. I think the first, the first sort of differential would be, oh, this person has COVID, and again, any sort of um, shortage of breath is going to be ventilation or some other type of oxygen support therapy. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so we've been talking about uh, the PCR test, which is a test for the presence of the virus. But we've also yes. heard quite a bit in uh, the last week or so about uh, the development of another type of test, the antibody test for uh, SARS-CoV-2. Um, and I wonder if you'd just uh, tell us a bit about that. Um, what, what kind of a test is this uh, and why would we need another test? Sure, of course. So, so the antibody test... Um... It is significantly different in terms of scope and use. So whereas the test we've been discussing is asking the question, is the virus present? So the antibody test, as the name suggests, is asking, you know, do, do we detect the presence of antibodies against the COV-2 virus? So of course, the antibodies are one of the hallmarks of our immune response to uh, infectious pathogens. So these are part of the uh, immunity uh, and they are produced on first exposure anywhere from sort of five to seven days after encountering the virus by the immune cells. And of course, their job is um, 
to to tag both the virus and virus particles and proteins for destruction by the immune system. But of course, what it, they are are very, very useful uh, signals that someone has mounted in an immune response and therefore encountered the virus. So it can still be used to ask the question about whether someone's got the disease if they're showing symptoms, although you'd need to wait a few days after symptoms start to, to, to really show if the, before you've got certainty that you should be detecting antibodies. Um, and one of the advantages for these is that for the virus, you've got, a, you've got a really finite window where they're going to have the virus and therefore where the test is going to become positive. Of course, if you miss that window, you're going to get a negative result. And of course, that won't answer the question, did someone have the virus? The advantage of the antibodies is they're much more long lived. So we know that for a vast majority of infections, the antibodies will, will stick around in someone's system for, for months, and if, if not years. So you've got a much longer window in which to ask the question, if someone was displaying symptoms, was that the virus? Because most people will be self-isolating at home. Uh, but of course, the, the key thing that's created the excitement is that um, in you know, a vast majority, let's face it, of infections, if you've had symptoms or if you've even just contracted the infectious agent, but then you're now cleared it, we would be making the assumption that your immune response has been sufficient to combat the virus and clear it from your system. And that is immunity. And we would anticipate, and again, I think it is true for a vast, vast majority of infections, that once you've done that, you've got this window, you've got this period where you are still immune to reinfection. OK, and, but for, very, for different infections, that, that window of immunity varies. We would certainly be anticipating that for COVID, that if you've mounted an immune response as signified by the antibodies, you're likely to be have immunity from disease for a period of months, maybe longer. We, we just don't know that yet. And so, of course, this now brings back the possibility, brings up the possibility that could we now use antibody testing to identify those people who are quite possibly now safe to exit lockdown? And of course, that has huge implications for key workers that are you know, being asked to continue working in areas with, of high transmission. So it, A, it could give them some confidence that they're, they're you know, in a safer position to work. You'd still obviously be using personal protective equipment. But for you know, the rest of the population, we're now in lockdown. And so the question now has to shift to how do we emerge from lockdown in a safe manner? And so the antibody yeah. test is, is, I think, being viewed that's one possible way by which we can start to say to people, OK, you, you should be OK to start to return to, let's call it normal life, at least in a phased way. And I think that's where much of the excitement about the antibody test comes with the caveat, as you pointed out, that it is at the moment an assumption that if you've got decent levels of antibodies, you're going to be protected from disease. There's also a, you know, a further point. And so there's reports out of China, of, of, of anecdotal reports, I, I should add, um, of some people testing positive for the virus a second time, even after they've had initial negative tests. So that's either because actually one of these negative tests was a false negative, and it may just simply have missed a period where the virus at low levels, and then you test them again, you happen to pick it up. Or it does possibly mean that although you've got antibodies, you can still pick up the virus. And therefore, the question is, although you may be protected against disease, do you still pose a risk for others? Of course, that has huge implications for key workers, those working in, in, in healthcare, and of course, preventing flare ups of second waves of disease if we start to lift the lockdown. But certainly the antibody test asks, you know, asks and answers a different question from the actual virus test itself. And uh, the, the other thing that uh, people seem to be assuming about these antibody tests is that they'll be very quick to perform. Uh, perhaps not an actual dipstick test, but something that could be done uh, 
not necessarily in a laboratory, but in the clinical setting. Is that a, a, a good assumption? Yes. So there are, as you point, there are actual dipstick tests so um, in development, and those are the ones that I think the government are aiming to roll out you know, as reports of delivery via Amazon and so. So these tests can be performed in a lab, and they can be made quantitative. So you can, you know, someone's got very high levels, low levels, medium levels of antibodies, but of course we don't know what that means in terms of immunity. Yeah. Um, but certainly, so if you picture, for example, the home testing for blood glucose, so there are certainly um, antibody tests that are being developed that will work in much the same way. So a little finger prick of blood is applied to one end of these little plastic cartridges. You then apply a little bit of buffer that comes with the kit uh, to, the, to the, the window port on it. And then within, and again, I, you, know, you see reports of some tests being 30 minutes, some 15 minutes, some five minutes. When you're in lockdown, that really doesn't matter. You know, it's, a, it's an immediate readout. It doesn't need to be sent away. And then you get one of these colored lines that develops. So one of the colored lines will just be a negative, but tells you that the kit, you know, the, the test has actually worked. But then, of course, the other ones would be the positives, where uh, a line at a different point on the test would be positive for antibodies. And therefore, as we've just discussed, you've had the virus and, of course, you know, a, some kind of assumption of immunity. So I, I certainly know and I've seen multiple manufacturers uh, developing these sort of point of care home use kits, which, of course, is hugely important for, for rollout because then you don't need this massive laboratory infrastructure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So really, uh, the, the, this is quite um, interesting from the point of view of uh, developing the social policy and uh, lockdown regulations, because um, you're going to need to figure out exactly how to use these tests in terms of uh, certification. Uh, perhaps self-certification will work. Perhaps it'll need to be done uh, in the presence of someone else. Um, anyway, this is all very, very interesting and uh, we're going to see what happens quite soon, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully uh, very soon. We, go. we were promised they would all be available on Amazon, of course. Yes. <laughs> There's an awful lot of testing that needs to go on with these antibody tests. Yeah. Uh, because it's not an amplification stage such as the PCR, it's clear that amongst the population, there are going to be people with different levels of antibodies. So we need to know how these tests perform with those different levels. And also, whereas with the virus, you've kind of got one target and we know it's present in all viruses. People produce a wide range of different antibody molecules, each with slightly different binding characteristics. So we need to, you know, there's a lot of validation using and the only way you can test this for COVID, at least, is with blood samples from COVID patients. There'll be an awful lot of work going on, working out how this test performs in terms of the, the dynamic range that it gives for what, you know, what constitutes a negative, what constitutes a positive. And then, then it'll start to be rolled out. And then, of course, by then, hopefully, we would have some sort of framework with how we're going to use it, because it has big questions in terms of, as you say, is, does it need to be validated by a healthcare professional? If you're going to sign someone off for release, as it were, from lockdown. Mm. Yeah, and that, that really needs to be worked out before we start flooding people's homes with these tests. OK, so we've talked about PCR. We've talked about antibody tests. Um, do you foresee any further advances in testing for the virus or, or the disease? Are there things that we uh, could see on the horizon? I don't know whether you've seen the report this morning. Um, so King's College London uh, group of Tim Spector has done this COVID symptom tracking app. So, yes, I have heard about this. Yeah. So, they, you know, over the last number of weeks, they've had a million and a half people download the app. And they've just asked people to record, uh, possibly by a sort of tick box of lists, the various symptoms that have been associated with COVID disease. They've, they've sort of analysed their results. So they had a, a, a several, quite a few thousand respondents who had had a COVID test. So they knew whether they were positive or negative. 
And so, of course, one of the things that's come out from this is this idea that loss of, of, of taste, loss of smell is associated with COVID infection. And I think they think that perhaps as many as 50 percent of those that have had a positive diagnosis reported loss of sense, loss of smell. So I think there's still interest in um, using a combination of self-reporting symptoms to supplement the testing. But again, you know, people's sense of smell varies at different times. We know that other respiratory tract infections can lead to the loss of, of smell and taste because of the, the, the cells that they infect. So I can't see it replacing it. But I think going into the future is how do we respond to future sort of viruses? There's going to be a whole range of different options. And certainly the public awareness of this has gone up enormously. So I think in the future, there will be ready-made sort of symptom reporting and, and uh, disease tracking facilities via mobile phones and other devices. That means we won't be starting from such a starting point. So I think you know, the, the lessons to be learned and putting in place a, a global infrastructure where we can respond to these things in a different way and hopefully much more effectively, I think will be very exciting. Great. Thanks very much, Andy. Uh, I think that you've done a great job this morning uh, in answering many people's questions about testing. Um, and I'm going to sign off now. So I'll bid you cheerio uh, and well, stay well. Before I sign off, I'd just like to remind everyone watching this of some really important things that we all have to do together to reduce the spread of the virus. Um, wash your hands frequently, keep your distance, avoid touching your face, catch coughs and sneezes, seek medical advice if you develop a persistent cough and fever. Meanwhile, stay safe. Stay well.